we have with us an unusually ex extensively talented speaker with uh, more than I can remember, so I'm going to read off the paper this time around. Uh, our speaker this evening uh, was formerly, had formerly before his current role, has led the Internet Operations System Infrastructure Team at AOL, where he, where he developed a time series, sorry, simple time series database, which has become AOL's standard storage engine for network and host, man, host monitoring data. Guys, this is the guy who built the database for AOL. Come on.
SQL database to get some extraction as you guys they ease that concern. So if you can talk JSON natively to the database and you have uh, JSON and GUI and there's you know, that much less uh, kind of data mapping you need to do inside your application, it makes things a lot easier. It makes a lot of sense. And so these are really probably the, the top concerns that folks have had with uh, the relational, the old world relational database. And again, I, I think scalability is probably <coughs> The thing that really put it on the map is that people who aren't looking to uh, scale up their architectures and as they scale, they end up sharding. As they shard, they start losing some of the value provided by the database. So now you can't do joins across shards. Uh, it's actually really difficult to do aggregates. You essentially, move that logic back into the application. And so now the database is providing a much simpler set of interfaces for you because you're implementing these things in your application. So you look at the database and say, well, you can do joins and aggregates, and it has a really smart planner, but I sharded all my stuff, and I can't really do that with my new database system, so why the hell am I using SQL with all this other stuff that comes with it? And so people just came to believe that SQL is really heavyweight, there's no way to make it scale. So if you can't scale, then SQL is the problem, relational is the problem, let's, let's dump SQL by the wayside, let's go to a, a, a different model. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why that's not quite the case, and that's not why relational field and, and why you actually you do want relational. Uh, so what so what would be the ideal database? So I, I think the first requirement uh in the all applications is it has to have built in automatic scale. Like it just you have to have a system that allows you to drop in pizza boxes and expand your data storage. We have that everywhere else in the application stack you do that with your app servers. You do that with your file storage or object store. Nobody here is worried about how they're going to store billions of files. If you're starting an Instagram now, you say there are solutions out there. There are either distributed file systems like you buy and you know, proven, or there are you know, things like Amazon S3. You never, you never, you never sort of say, well, how am I going to build this thing? How am I going to figure out how I'm going to spread out all my objects across tons of little pizza boxes? And actually, if you look six or seven years ago, that wasn't the case. There are people who are still building these types of architectures, right? It just it hasn't caught up with what it didn't become commoditized. And I think the same thing is happening to databases, right? It's just in order to even play a really new database solution, you have to be scaled. Right? So I just I, I think that's kind of the answer these days. If you're coming up with a database solution and you didn't provide a scale out a scale out strategy, you're kind of screwed. Right? You're just going to fail. There's no there's no value there. Um, and it has to have built in fault tolerance and high availability. Once you move into a world where everything that you have runs in little commodity pizza boxes, the thing that you realize when you have a thousand pizza boxes, they're going to be failing all the time. And so you have to build a system that's resilient to that failure, and you have to have a system that's, that's online when these failures happen. So fault tolerance and high availability is uh, pretty high on, on the list of things. And then there are things like uh, flexible schema management. So you know, as we're also moving to a slightly different world of development. Um, high, Highly shortened CPF cycles, everything's very iterative. I'm just pushing things either every day or every week, but it's, it's a very quick turnaround. And if I decide that I make a mistake in my scheme, I want to be able to fix it right now. I don't want to have to be able to schedule you know, two weeks in advance with some change committee meetings to decide how I'm going to do an alter table on a database, right? Like I want to be able to push out a new code, have the schema change happen, and be done with it. So that's that's what I mean by flexible schema management. I want to be able to make live in production, and that's because that's how my development team thinks it's sort of thing you work. You want to be able to roll out application changes pretty quickly. And you want to have a model that, you want to have an interface to the database that doesn't get in the way of development. So that's you know, what's an important one. So I, I think that's one of the downsides that we've seen in SQL databases is that you have this thing that sits in the middle of the color or A lot of companies, a lot of products, and a lot of open source solutions that are trying to overcome the barrier. You have whole web programming frameworks that are built around this to have ease access to the database. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. You can still uh, have a language that looks like SQL that's uh, relational, but that eases a lot of this friction between uh, the database and the application. And really, at the end, what we want is simplicity. I think you don't want to have to think about all this stuff. Um, the example 
example that I use is Amazon S3. Uh, most folks don't know how Amazon S3 works currently. They don't really, you know, it's not an open source application. Most people don't care. And it solves their problem. It's, it's, a, it's a key value object store. I can store arbitrarily large amounts of data in there. It just works. I can get on with it. Like nobody, if you're building an application today, that's not, there's no value in your business in trying to recreate what Amazon is doing. And so if you were going with a solution like a, a shared database, Scale. And what the value is that for the business perspective, everybody has to do that. So we'll just have a couple of slides about um, some customer growth clusters. So this is uh, Massive Media. They're one of our European customers. And I like to use them in slides. It's not necessarily their biggest deployment, but uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, these guys have been around for just over 10 years. And their first web property was called Netlog social uh, networking site that in some ways lost out to Facebook before you know, Facebook sort of had this uh, unstoppable trajectory. Uh, these guys got a couple hundred million users. They were very, 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 very large. And they had something like uh, 100 MySQL shards. And they decided that they were going to start a new web property, spin up property that was a dating site. And they were going to cross promote this dating site on their, uh, on their social network. And when they were doing this, you know, these are people who built highly scalable database infrastructures. They have a hundred shard instance application. And they decided they didn't want to do sharding. After they started looking at how to build a data site, how to shard it, it turns out that it's actually pretty difficult to position your data sets because dating is uh, fundamentally a relational problem. Right? You're trying to establish, you're trying to establish relationships between people and how they match. Different dimensions. So you can't exactly partition your data set by user uh, because that, that makes cross shard shatter uh, a pretty good problem. Um, there are other issues with partitioning, for example, by uh, you know, geographic locale because then you have unevenly balanced shards. Some locales are much hotter than others. And so these guys, at any cost, wanted to avoid the sharding problem, and that's how they got uh, their hands on some clusters here. And uh, you know, they launched the site in April. About the time that uh, we sent some of our boxes, they had set us up as a slave to their MySQL database. And so we have the complete copy of their data set and they were running some tests. Kind of standard uh, email cycle. And so one day we get, a, we get an email from those guys and said, hey, congratulations, you're now in production. And so we're trying to figure out, so okay, well, that's, that's great, but you know, what happened? Maybe they're telling you to push us into production. And they hit this wall, they hit this limit. And the reason they hit that limit is that this is a pretty easy box, but they had a substantial uptick in the user group. Right? We had a logarithmic scale here. It's great. That is like, um, it, was, it was actually it turned out to be a distribution. Oh, okay, but maybe is it in the midst of about writes? Or is it it wasn't, it wasn't writes, so it was a combination of CPU and RMs. They're pretty well balanced. So it's, the application itself is something like uh, 90, 10, 95, 10. It's, it's, it's a little bit more write intensive than a typical web app because uh, they end up logging almost all the actions that happen on the site. So if you go and use somebody's profile, that becomes a database. It's not sure that because the fact that you use somebody's profile means that there's some set of interesting characteristics about that profile that they can go analyze later. So it's a fairly, uh, yeah, so you become the right. Right, the, clicking on a clicking on the profile generates tons of other data that's within it, but there's quite a bit of uh, right back. So so these guys get a limit to a single database instance and you kind of you have an option here, right? So what, what do you do next? So the easiest thing to do is to probably go get a bigger server. And so let's say I'm an eight or sixty-four box, I could go get a thirty-two four box, I could go get a sixty-four four box, I can raise the memory on the right, I can start investing in more exotic hardware, I can start looking at Confusion AO. Maybe it's on Confusion AO is going to cut it for me. I can start looking at my bigger boxes to provide with memory. Um, you know, the sky is the limit, but with each one of those solutions, it's, uh, it's much more expensive and it's not giving you the same kind of price performance that you got in the previous solution. So let's say that they doubled the performance of this box to 155 on my transaction second limit to 11 on my transaction second limit. Well, what that really did is it botched some time. It botched you a couple of months of runtime. So they knew that fundamentally scale up wasn't going to 
to be the solution. You need to do something different. Of course, that's the last thing that they've known from scaling up the networks. And what's interesting uh, about these barriers is that so they've expanded twice. These were uh, online expansions, which is the of the web and the button and the UI. Now the cluster is that much larger. It's that much more capacity. It's that much more transactions per week. And to the application, it still looks like it's going to go wrong. So it's, 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 it's completely transparent. And uh, you know what? You need to be able to take that hand and it's transparent. Yes. So I mean, internally, there are multiple boxes that the database is split across uh, multiple uh, instances. But each instance holds a small portion of the data set. So you can think of the kind of sharding built in or more flexible or something like that. You're sharding a top box. Yes. yes. And we're also distributing query value. I'm not talking about things like primary two or kind of storage and very simple point selects uh, in the database. Uh, quite a substantial portion of our workload is actually uh, multi-way joint appointments. So it's, it's, it's a fairly interesting mix of priorities. It's not it's only a simple set of So do you have a question? I have a question. Do you use like FPGAs or GPUs? No, we don't. And actually, um, Clustrix is really a software company. And we think we're the smartest at being in the software and doing a good job of you know, distributing the great knowledge. Yeah, so that's, that's the story we're trying to tell about why, why you don't want to go to the scale up approach. One is, it's, they're just temporary boosts. And you're talking <coughs> about the power exotic like hardware. I can't go buy an off the shelf system that's going to have an FPGA system SQL in it. And those things take a couple of years to develop. By the time you've developed it, running that same engine on the next Intel CPU is going to give you better performance.
I uh, see the problem in most, right? And uh, the most sensitive to the solution. The hardware you need for a certain number of neutrons are all Yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends on your workload. I like, you know that this is, this is kind of a common question we can talk about in terms of users or uh, web applications, but it's, it's difficult to say. So these guys had a three node cluster, and in a three node cluster, they didn't need to upgrade to the laptop to the system. So uh, in this case, the cluster's three node system uh, actually did better than uh, the MySQL single server.
so now they're just, they're actually on the percent of the trust base. There's no MySQL instance that's in the problem with the trust base. So it's much longer. But they, they didn't require much recoding or understanding. Yeah, it's dropping. It just, to the application, it's like, yeah. And so I, I think we're covering most of these, like, the last 30 slides, but this is exactly like, like, like you want to have these features built into the product. You just you don't want to have to worry about the database and over the You want to keep using the database that has a fairly uh, rich interface to it because it means that you don't have to re implement parts of that interface in the application. And overall, you, you want things to be simple. I mean, that's one of the really guiding principles of clusters is this stuff is pretty complex, but how can we make it simple for people to actually use it? So yeah, I, I go back to this example and I was this theory it's the most easy to grasp. It's a complex product for the game. There's a lot of interesting problems to solve in the sort of file store like that, but nobody here can understand it. It just it works and it's as simple as it is. So now we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit um, and talk about object, well, I should say really document based interface. I'm sorry, all the object I realize that there's another set of databases maybe from 10 years ago where object relational was a big deal and folks were battling some of the same problems that we see now is, well, SQL is tabular and an application is an object model, but when I'm SQL into an object model, it wouldn't be great if object databases were stored in an object It turns out that there are a bunch of downsides to that, so if it's not your application talking to the database, you're not screwed. <laughs> so how can you get you know, all of the, the entire ecosystem of things that talk to the database uh, getting access to the data. So now we have um, kind of this sort of documents uh, based databases, which are very similar, but they're a little bit more approachable to things that are now the application. So they have a, a more standard machine format, which is usually JSON. I think JSON is more than how how to be a model and just have to uh, data stores pretty clear. And so now we can talk about what a JSON based app model program. And so I, I, I like I like to explain things by example and set it to set a little example where we're writing an application that's forum software. So I have forums, within forums I have posts, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that most of you are familiar with kind of this idea of the JSON documents inside of other documents here. It's no reason you have So there's just kind of a, a, a specific example. In SQL, you would have an ID of table. And a uh, table has basically <coughs> rows and rows. Rows are these fields that have uh, data types. And document-based models are pretty similar. They, uh, I'll talk about Mongo because it's, it's, it's the closest to something like this, kind of just a little bit away. But it's, it's the same idea. They have a uh, concept called a collection. But documents can be nested. So in this case, um, we have a field called post. Post is actually an array. And inside of this array, we have the documents. So all of my posts are within some documents. So if I wanted to see all the posts associated with this thread, I just want that. And so that's, it's immediately appealing to say, oh wow, that's great, right? Like I just make a single call to the database, and I get all the data that I want in the format that I want, because I stored it that way. And chances are, I can pass a lot of this through back to the application. But it turns out that, you know, that's only 80% of the problem, and 80% is particularly the sticking point of all the software that you get. It's very difficult to get it to the other 20%. So what are some of the problems that come up? Well, let's, let's, let's look at it kind of like a couple of different workloads. So one is, um, give me all the posts in the thread by open really easy to do, right? Like I, I have my thread document, and thread document is a field that has all my posts, and by the way, I'm just storing them in it. So great. It's a really simple query. I'm optimized for that. If that's the only thing that my application does, then I'm cool. The problem is, now I want to make the interface nicer, so I want to personalize the site for somebody who's logging in. So I want to log in, and I want to be able to see my events screen. I want to say, these are the last 10 posts that I made. Now the problem becomes a little bit more difficult. Well, I should I should add an index because that's the way access to I want to be able to provide a constraint, say for a specific 
user to hit the posts that are my date, so I can show you the, the, um, the, last, the last, last 10 posts. So, so you can all understand how any database just needs to have this concept. There are indices that will help you to speed up access to a certain set of data based on your work. Uh, it's independent of whether you're using a single database or using Mongo DB or Apache or whatever. This is fundamentally what it is. So now I, I, I hit a problem, or crap, you know, my site took off, everybody is looking close, I have millions of users, my single instance database fell over, I mean, the biggest box I can get, I'm, I'm about to hit a scalability wall, the website is going to go down, what do I do? And so I said, okay, well I need to be able to distribute my data set across my systems because I don't want to build a scale out of it. And this is where you know, the problem starts. It seems innocuous, but it kind of snowballs. So how do you decide how to split up your data set? You have to figure out what your partition is going to be. So you have to know which documents are going to go to which one of these sharded buckets, because that's going to dictate how it's going to access the database. So in this case, you said, well, okay, my most common access pattern is actually by thread, because I get all the posts in the thread. I want to make it so that when I query for a thread, I don't talk to all the shards because that's a nightmare. You don't want to be talking to multiple systems. It didn't actually solve scalability problem. So you want to just cheat, go by thread and say, okay, you know, this, this set of shards actually hold, hold this set of threads. You know how to find that data. So we're requesting that, that have a specific thread ID. It's great to go to a specific shard and solve that problem. But what about my other thread? And so I'm kind of screwed on this one because all of my shards are broken out by thread ID, but I don't have this data organized by user. So what happens, right? So I have this document. I have to have a single shard key that I've chosen. Uh, but it completely broke this query because I didn't get any. I didn't gain any. In order for me to answer this, this workload of how do I find all the requests made for specific user in the top 10, I can't do that without talking to all the shards. So that becomes a scalability problem. Anytime you see this kind of a broadcast message, the distributed system you can get. Can I have a question? Now you're distributing data to create this problem. You also now have very activity to distribute it. Then if you query the only for exactly where people are going to get those part, but if you query the concentrated use, that would be another question. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're sort of we're making this simple. Let's just say that we have there's no super hot threads. Right? We have tons of threads and we have tons of users. Uh, most of the time, the user is going to log in and look at specific threads. So that's what's my scalability problem. You're right that you could have hot, hot, uh, hot buckets as well. And so you might want some more granularity in how you distribute the data set. But um, that's kind of another sort of problem to address. So let's, let's, let's try to solve this problem. So how, how, can we, how can we get around this? So one thing we can do is we can just create a second copy of the data. Right? So we can say, I'm going to organize kind of another collection and I'm going to distribute it with So in this case, I'm going to create something that's storing just the post and it's organized in a way that allows me to query it efficiently so I can go to a specific shard to get an answer. The problem with, you know, with this approach is we're essentially creating a second table, a second collection, whatever you want to call it, and that's a waste of space. And now I built a system in which things can get inconsistent because uh, the set of hosts that a user is looking at for, from this angle, right, from give me all of the posts that a specific user made by date, are not the same set of posts that I have in my threads. Right? So how do I how do I make sure that I when I go to update these posts that I'm updating both spots and that I don't end up in a world where Post ends up in one data store but not the other, and vice versa. Right? So you, now you have you run into consistency in distributed transaction problem. And all of a sudden you're kind of, oh crap, well now you can run into that world, but I guess it's okay, so maybe I'll write some software that goes through the garbage collection things and tries to make sure that there's actually integrity in the data set. But that's not a great place to be. Um, and really, what, what you're talking about is you're, you're almost manually maintaining the index here. So, you know, what's What's an index? You know, it's, it's essentially just like looking at two tables. Like you have 
an index organizes the data in a way that makes sense to your query. So if these are the set of posts that I'm interested in, I'm really just doing a join back to my primary database. In fact, in a lot of old school relational databases, when you look at the, the query plan outputs, this is what it looks like. It looks like from the primary perspective, this looks like a join. And that's essentially what you're doing. So even if you have a NoSQL system, what ends up happening is that that NoSQL system is really doing a join for each query internally. You know they say that the two joins? They are parentheses, right? This is, this is, this is the operation of the, what they're doing. Um, so why can't we have, why can't we just embrace it and say, okay, well, I want to be able to do joins. Because, hey, I'm already doing it in indices. You see the value. Um, they kind of punt in it and say, well, it, you know, I, I don't want to do joins because it's a hard problem. Strictly joins are hard. You know, nobody's really solved it. Possible problem. And it's kind of interesting because in a lot of ways that sounds a lot like what the initial MySQL um, versus Postgres uh, resin slash that look like. I don't know if you guys remember this, but there's a lot of uh, MyISIM apologies in for not having transactional support in MyISIM. We always used to go back and say, well, you don't really need transactions. You know, it's, it's, it's super fast the other way. You're just, you, you can always return to an application. And it turns out that as soon as MySQL integrated MDD and they got transaction, and some of the other features like recognition clarity and great statistics for the query planner, all of a sudden, MySQL really started taking off because now it was an incredible uh, competitor in the database space because, hey, you didn't have to rebuild your index when the data was matched because your set and your indices were consistency. This is going to be flush and fits because, hey, flush and fits So, what you really want is uh, a flexible database problem. And you want to ask the database to organize data, even in a distributed environment, in a way that makes sense. So in, in our example, for, for, for the kind of posts collection slash table, um, in clusters you can drive that down to a per index kind of distribution. So you can say, okay, well my primary table of posts is going to be distributed by this. So I can tell the database just to do this. And an index that I created on this collection slash post or the product. It's going to have the following distribution, just, just user. Right? So if I want to find the last 10 posts made for a specific user, I know that I can go to a specific system that's going to pull all of those keys. And by the way, the index actually contains more keys than this one. Right? So we have that kind of uh, flexibility. And because clusters fundamentally solve the distributed join problem, the index lookup is really a join problem. We're able to do this. So other systems, aren't able to do this. They run into the roadblocks because they fundamentally haven't solved the data distribution problem. They kind of do it this way, where they, so as soon as you start doing accesses by index, things break. And that's why, um, you know, there's kind of been a lot of noise uh, by the MySQL cluster folks and other distributed uh, database, uh, distributed relational database companies. And, and I think the reason why they haven't gotten an update is because a lot of the marketing message sounds the same. It's like, hey, we're going to solve the issues problem. It's going to work great. But the issue is that they didn't solve some of these fundamental problems. And so it starts breaking down in the real world use cases. So all of the benchmarks that they end up publishing are kind of ready to look at. Hey, that works great. Let's do this guy. As soon as you start having a query load that's more realistic, it looks like this, where you have joints and you have joints and secondary keys index lookups, all of a sudden it falls apart. And the reason it falls apart is because, hey, they didn't solve the data distribution problem. Now we're talking about distributed query. We've already hit the kind of the first the first load. So this what's my point. Well, your data is really relational. And you want to be able to do joints because joints are nice. And it doesn't really matter what language you're talking about. It's NoSQL. Mark my words, there's going to be a time when all these NoSQL guys are going to start producing interfaces that look much closer to SQL that are enabling you. They're going to start enabling you to do joints in the database because right now your application is doing those joints. Because if you need to correlate two pieces of information uh, from some of these collections, on your feed, for example, you end up going to one collection, one set of calls, and you're pulling up a bunch of IDs, issuing a second call to another collection. That set of ideas. Hey, congratulations, you just discovered that with database. So, uh, and there's, right, that, that's a problem because.
because that doesn't have anything. That doesn't have any credit. So it's always a bill. Yeah, it's a lot of bill. That's That's right. And so there's, there's, the problem is that if you leave that guess wrong, if you've got a simple problem on a drawing order, hey, you've got to go change the app to fix that. Right? We're not talking about changing. So maybe I want to redo the problem definition. So we want to do all of the things that we want in our database, but we really do want the relation. We want it to do joints. Right? Because fundamentally, that's a lot of the kinds of workloads that you start seeing after you got the initial hurdle of, hey, I created a collection, I created a table, and here's my primary use case. There are all these other use cases. 30% of your queries I may mean, not sound like a lot, but 30% of those queries are responsible for 90% of the database portfolio and stuff like that. It's a big part of the CPU perspective. That's not available. And this is kind of interesting. I thought I would share this with you guys. So this is an example of a query language that Cluster's engineers designed um, internal to the database when the database speaks to itself and queries itself. It uses this language that's called real. And this language has all these attributes. Oh, hey, it's no SQL. It's just a SQL relation database. Yeah, it's good. So <laughs> you can still be relational and be no SQL. And here's an example. It's actually, the reason we do this is we've um, added a lot of concurrency primitives into the language that aren't easily expressed in SQL. And when we compile a SQL query, there's actually kind of another dialect of this language that SQL gets compiled into. So we're pretty quickly just lose SQL in the system anyway because we essentially create programs for you that evaluate the validation query. So whether the query language is SQL or something else, it doesn't really matter because you want to be able to address the fundamental the fundamental constraints of building the database, which is how do I get my data quickly and how do I have a fairly expressive interface to get that data? So this is kind of very right, making sure that some set of uh, computation happens before some other system. So when we looked at you know, some of these other languages, it said, do, do we create, do we create another query language or do we try to do something with SQL? And we decided that as a first crack, why not just try to extend SQL and create an object relational query language that can really manipulate the JSON documents data? Because I think that's that's probably a lot of the power, a lot of the addictive nature that comes from uh, this new way of SQL database is that you're able to manipulate JSON uh, directly in the database and it's able to do some interesting things with it and keep directly into, the, into your document and guys have things like that. <coughs> so here's a, a simple example uh, that, that I used. And for those of you who are familiar with Postgres, Postgres I apologize, we, you know, we stole that out there with all the it's not a cast. Uh, so what this allows us to do is actually access fields within the document. So the data just fundamentally understands the JSON and knows how to uh, reach into these objects. And so in this case, I'm just saying, okay, well, give me, we know that post is, is, is an array based on the previous example. And I just want to get a slice of that array so you can the last, the last 10 posts made there. So I just express that in secret. It's a pretty concise to understand what this is trying to do. We're querying the post collection relation you want to call it it's, it's, it's a hybrid model. And you know my, my language is able to reach directly into the like into the document as well to be able to access the fields. And by the way, when I get my data back from the database, I didn't get it back in a traditional tabular format that's easy to I gave it back to you as a JSON document. So now I have a system that's able to read and write from the database in JSON. But the query language is you know, SQL reminiscent. The great thing about this is that this is actually a very expressive language, right? So when you start doing things like joins, you start doing things like aggregates, there's a way that you can already express that language, right? I don't have to go through the trouble of designing my own language that's going to give me many years of trials you know, that SQL went through to figure out what the right set of I don't want to digress too much because you're sounding like on a good roll. <coughs> One of the things I keep hearing as a 
common thread through all these discussions about NoSQL databases and the latest flavors of this, documents versus I, I think I think a lot of things are getting lost in terms of SQL is a language and it gets you know compiled or whatever into something else. It isn't the database any more than C is the computer. Uh, it's just a set of instructions that can be ultimately manipulated by something else. So, the, and most of these document database systems are really doing the joins a priori and then stuffing them into memory and they've done it all up front and if you want to reorganize it, it goes a different way. So my question really is, is does Clustrix or is there a way to basically separate the engine out that does all the heavy lifting and the sort of output expressiveness as, I mean, I should be able to say, give me JSON, give me a table, give me it in, you know, in Sanskrit. It shouldn't matter what the output format is. What you just said is exactly the point I'm trying to make. Okay. <laughs> That's is fine. that you can, is that the, it's the database engine that matters as long as the internal representation for the query inside of your database is expressive enough to be able to answer these questions. You shouldn't be able to stick in so this right, I mean, this is an example of an interface that nobody else in the world has. It's a NoSQL interface, right? It, it has, there's some multiple here between what SQL can do and what this interface can do, but this interface has something that SQL can't do. Right? It looks like right. there's something that can express in this. It looks right? so like we do have multiple that. languages already talking to customer systems. Right? And so this is, in some ways, is another example of that where Hey, I just I taught my database engine and I can understand these JSON objects as or these JSON documents as a first class data type. I can reach in them and validate them and join them self with them. I should be able to start indexing them. There's nothing there's nothing about SQL that prevents you from doing this. It's really all the magic happens inside of the database. So then you start looking at some of these other aspects of the system. Like I don't want to you know, we kind of went to the document model, so I use MongoDB as an example, but one of the things that those guys didn't do that well is actually build a robust data storage engine behind it. So their concurrency model was updated in place with a single block in the entire database system. And so that, you know, that, that works great with kind of small mind prototypes. As soon as you start getting real writes and workloads, you get kind of screwed because all the writers are single stream essentially because they're a single mutex preventing other writers from writing to the data store concurrently. Oh, by the way, while you're writing the readers can. So the idea of like, you know, you need the rollout block by SMT level, this is the database exactly right. okay. And so they, you know, they, in some ways, they're, they're able to get away with this because they just say, okay, well, your data set has to live in memory. And by default, they have their ability to bring it up. So I'm writing this, so the writer doesn't control it, and I always have to pull up these slots. But as soon as you start adding these features that we saw, you know, all of these things that kind of this first generation of legacy database systems got right. Like, oh, well, hey, you can turn into your data tech. <laughs> You're not going to lose shit like your power goes away. Okay, well, let's drop that so we can solve the other problem, which is performance and scalability. You learn a little bit that right? I mean, it's, 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 so in this, and when you start adding these back, all of a sudden, we're moving back into a world which, well, you know, these features have a cost to them. So the fundamental problem that you need to solve is how do you distribute so maybe if I have all the features instead of needing 50 boxes, I'll need 100 boxes. But that's okay because I can rest at night and know that if my data center loses power, I might want to come back and have to go over and back up to the point. And does Clutrix support this out of the box? Is this well, this is all configurable via whatever configuration mechanisms are there? Yeah, it's out of the box. Connecting to the system, So it's a lot easier for us to get 
into a site like uh, the Mass Media guys because hey, they already have an application and they know they're close to a scalability pressure and they can just test this before I see it. And so then we can start using features that aren't necessarily in SQL. Right? So that was sort of what I wanted to talk about. What's the pricing model? So uh, it's a great question. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, you know, we are, um, we're not, a, we're not an open source data industry. So, 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 uh, software. And uh, there are two models that we're looking at. So, what you can get now is uh, hardware that you get from customers. So, so the hardware you want to have uh, your Apple laptop. The software and the hardware is integrated in the first one. Uh, the next model that uh, Thank you. 
And now they probably have all these other drugs. But it's really, it's the concurrence of the database that is killing people. They have so many concurrent transactions going on that are So, I mean, it's, it's kind of the standard SQL stuff, so then Apple's which you can provide users, like, lock down privileges to tables. If you want to, you can speak as a self um, What uh, like, you said this linear scaling, have you written tests, like, created a cluster at a certain point where you start to see that big rate? Um, and also, like, is there a point at which, like, you, you just need to, yeah. you, you can't start to keep stacking shells in this cluster, like, in your mind, like, the software, like, it might be two years out. The largest, the largest cluster that um, we tested in front of was 24 hours. And that was one of the part of the I would say that the full scale of AIDS will go into the right now. After that, I know that there are some caches within the cloud that are constantly being designed. From an architectural perspective, there isn't really a situation, but there are some implementation bottlenecks that will be ironed out to keep the linear scalability. I mean, the linear scalability is really, if you look at it from an algorithmic perspective, you can understand that it should be able to scale. So it's really just not the down level implementation details that can cause people to run into bottlenecks. It's not. This is this kind of thing, like this is a number of problem for scalability. You can't you can't build a thousand of systems like this because you can't have a query that addresses all the last things. It just doesn't matter. Right? So I'm confident that your system doesn't have this kind of algorithmic scalability problems. Um, like what's the the bus speed on the back plane with like these clusters and test cases? So so what we what the hardware that we have now is section that 
that for us, say, hey, my system balance, yeah, it's okay, it's not protected. Here's how my data is distributed across the three nodes for pretty even data distribution. And I can look at kind of a snapshot of what was the data it's doing for the past 24 hours in terms of data movement, and hey, is this a reorganization for a couple hours? So why would we do that? Well, we do data movement. But to answer your question, you can actually always walk up to the cluster system and be able to ask it this question, which is, what is my system doing right now? What are my top queries? And are they OK? And so in this case, I don't know if there's a really large the system is sitting idle, but it's saying they have all 23% CPU utilization across the cluster. But how are you know, this number of within 60%? Right? So how, what's, what's my workload? Well, it turns out that right now this is my top query. That one query is taking up 67% of all the CPU cycles that are used by the system. So why is it doing it? Turns out that if you look on the right-hand side, there's that rose red versus uh, rose out, or better name for it's rose used, not discarded by the filter. Look at the skew, right? On average, we're reading 300,000 rows and using only 5,000. So that's why it gets a little red dot. So what's wrong with this query? Well, we actually don't have an index on Starter. So not only are we filtering by them, we're also trying to order the results. I had an index this query with this query. So we let folks have this kind of interface and this kind of insight into their application. They immediately get value out of it because this is real-time introspection. It just it happens as part of the way that the product is designed. So you can always see what set of queries are running in the system. So another, another kind of language these guys is, um, by the way, a lot of this has been built basically from input from our support folks, and our support folks are they're basically GPAs. The GPAs can know clusters really well from an architecture perspective, and they can help you understand what's going on, not only with the database, but with the application, and how the two are interacting. And so a super common question that we always get is, database is going nuts, things have gotten slow, 90% utilization. That happened. So, like I say, hey, well, did you change anything? I said, no, I'm changing anything. But that's always the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, right? so the reality of the situation is that something changed. And you can usually see that by looking at, you know, what is my CPU? Sorry, this is a different CPU scale as well. So, you know, what is my CPU utilization in rows red? You can say, well, something changed in this time frame. So let me select that time frame. And now I can see, okay, this is what the database was doing when it was working okay, when things were stable. And this is what the database is doing now when it's not okay. So there's some set of new queries that showed up, and usually what ends up happening is you get a bunch of red balls like this that sit at the top that say 90% of all your CPU cycles are consumed by these three queries. Oh, by the way, part of the data is on top. That somebody pushed you know, the guy who got patient here. So building building tools like this that just enable folks to see what's happening with their system is just directly built into the top. It, it's a it's a built-in uh, profile or exactly. yeah, just amazing. But since it's real time, yeah. So it's real time introspection. So all of these these kind of query profiles they're just we have these national internally that just statistics on them, and so it's, it's free for us to show us. Right? So it doesn't matter if your system is 100% under load, you always get this out because you don't have to go run an expensive profile or that's going to take your system down more because it's, it's struggling to keep up with the
Thanks, guys.